Ammonia is a naturally occurring toxicant derived from waste. It is comprised of both nitrogen and hydrogen. Ammonia can be introduced into a swimming pool from a variety of environmental factors. It can come in from the wind, the rain, leaves, all kinds of things. Ammonia can also be introduced to a swimming pool through human factors. Skin cells, sweat, urine, lotions, and saliva. When ammonia enters a swimming pool and comes in contact with free available chlorine, sometimes the free available chlorine molecule will replace one of the hydrogen molecules in the ammonia forming what is known as monochloramine. If we were to add a little bit more chlorine to the water, we would force the change from monochloramine to dichloramine, again by replacing one of the hydrogen molecules in the ammonia. If we added even more chlorine to the water, we would force the change from dichloramine to trichloramine, also known as nitrogen trichloride. Nitrogen trichloride then would tend to gas up above the water once our free available chlorine reaches 10 times the amount of the combined chlorine level. Gases up and blows away in the wind, which is the goal, ultimately, of breakpoint chlorination and how we rid the pool of the chloramine. Ah, hello there, Professor Pool here. One of the important ways of determining whether or not you have chloramines in your swimming pool is through the swimming pool water test itself. So in order to determine if we have a combined chlorine level, we must first test our free available chlorine level. To do this, we take test solution number one. We have filled our test block. This is a colorimetric test where we match the colors from the solution to the color on the test block. In a colorimetric test for free available chlorine, we fill the vial to the top line with water, keeping conscious all the vial that there is a phenomena known as the meniscus. The meniscus is the natural curvature of water due to surface tension when it is put into a container. So we have filled the vial to the top line with water. I will first take test solution number one, and I will squeeze five drops into the vial, one drop at a time, hosing the bottle straight up and down to ensure that I am getting a consistent drop size. I do not want to hold the bottle a little to the left or a little to the right because if I do, the drop size would be inconsistent. I also do not want to just squeeze all the drops at once, not allowing air back into the bottle because if I don't allow the air back into the bottle, that will give me a consistently smaller drop size. So I must make sure my drops are all of the same size. So test solution number one, I put in the five drops of DPD number one. Next, I will take DPD number two, and again, the same process, five drops, one drop at a time, releasing in between each drop, holding the reagent straight up and down to ensure that I get a consistent drop size. I will then take the cap, for the vial and put that over the top and shake the bottle. I do not want to use my fingers, I don't want to touch the reagents because I have my own body chemistry and that will change the results. So I shake the reagent after I have put in the five drops of DPD1 and DPD2 and hold this up to the lights of the northern horizon. This will then give me my free available chlorine level. And I am seeing my free available chlorine level is at 2.0. Next, to determine my combined chlorine level, there is no test to directly test for combined chlorine. I must test my total chlorine level. And from that, I subtract the free available chlorine, the test I just got. And then that the difference will be my combined chlorine level. So I take the cap off again. Same vial that already has DPD 1 and 2, I will add 5 drops of DPD number 3. One drop at a time, 
releasing in between each drop, holding the bottle strap on down to ensure that I get a consistent drop size. Once I have done that, I will again take the cap and put that on the vial and shake the vial and hold it to the lights of the northern horizon. Now I can see that my total chlorine level is three, three parts per million. My free available chlorine level was two parts per million. So if I take my total chlorine and I subtract my free chlorine, that will give me my combined chlorine level. So in this body of water, I have a combined chlorine level of one part per million. Total chlorine of three minus my free available chlorine of two leaves me with a combined chlorine level of one part per million. Now, we have to make that go away. So if we had a 55,000 gallon pool and the facility used sodium hypochlorite and our water tests were a free available chlorine of 1.5 parts per million with a total chlorine of 2 parts per million and a pH of 7.5, we would first determine what our combined chlorine level was. To do this, we take our total available chlorine reading. From that, we subtract our free available chlorine reading. The difference is our combined chlorine level. Again, with the goal of achieving a free available chlorine level of 10 times the combined chlorine level, we would take that combined chlorine level and multiply it by 10 to find what our free available chlorine level would need to be in order to achieve breakpoint chlorination in this swimming pool. 0.5 times 10 equals 5 parts per million. So we would need a free available chlorine level of 5 parts per million in order to achieve breakpoint chlorination in this pool. Take that breakpoint chlorination number and then we will subtract our free available chlorine level. Why? Because we already have that. So we don't need it again. We only need a total of 5 parts per million. We already have 1.5 parts per million. So if I take 5 parts per million, my breakpoint number, and subtract my free available chlorine, that would give me a number of 3.5 parts per million. I need 3.5 parts per million more in order to reach 10 times my free, my combined chlorine level in order to force the transmission and achieve breakpoint chlorination. In that same pool of 55,000 gallons of water, we already said we are using sodium hypochlorite. The dosage for sodium hypochlorite is 10.7 ounces per 10,000 gallons to get a one part per million increase. We just calculated that we need a 3.5 part per million increase. So from my label instructions, I will take my 10.75, 10.7 ounces and put that into my label dose amount. Then. I will take the amount of water my label tells me that my 10.7 ounces will treat in order to give me my one part per million increase. Now, from here, I will take my actual pool gallon of 55,000 gallons and divide that by the 10,000 gallons that my label tells me it will treat. I will also take my increase of 3.5 parts per million that I need and divide that by the one part per million my label tells me the dose will give me. 55,000 divided by 10,000 gives me 5.5. That means I have 10,000 gallons of water 5.5 times. 3.5 parts per million divided by one part per million gives me 3.5. That means I need to increase my free available chlorine level by one part per million 3.5 times. Then I can do the multiplication from left to right. 10.7 times 5.5 times 3.5 equals 205.97 ounces of sodium hypochlorite needed. But measuring ounce by ounce is silly. So we will convert this to gallons to determine how many we need. We'll take the 205.97 ounces and divide that by 128 because there are 128 ounces in a gallon. In order to achieve breakpoint chlorination in this 55,000 gallon pool, we will require 1.6 gallons of sodium hypochlorite.